Well, hello, AP World History. Not the way I wanted to start Unit 1, but uh, what are we going to do? All right, I'm, I'm, re I'm recalling old Rolling Stone song about 1968, maybe 69. You can't always get what you want. And uh, definitely the case right here. So you get sick notes, sick notes uh, to start us off on Unit 1. I'm going to take you through uh, a little bit here. I think we're going to spend a little bit of time in... Uh, Eh, part of Asia, and uh, we'll do a, about, uh, I'll, I'll probably kind of try to get this about 20 to 30 minutes, and um, and that'll get you something that you can get started on your own in Unit 1 before we, uh, yeah, jump back in. So you've got the, uh, the title of uh, this first unit here, The Global Tapestry. Uh, a tapestry is kind of like a uh, it's kind of like an old art form from uh, back in uh, these these times. Uh, they would look to us like big like drapes or curtains, but have uh, like a painting on them. And usually, a painting uh, or, or or whether it was embroidered or something like that would tell some kind of a really kind of grand epic story. And so um, we use Unit One to kind of do I don't know. It's in a way it's kind of like picking up what we were doing in Unit Zero, where we're going to take a little bit of a like a snapshot of the world uh, in 1200. And so we'll we'll kind of just kind of skip around different parts of the world and and now start to take things a little more in depth uh, versus what we were doing in Unit Zero, and um, and focusing on what uh, kind of you know kind of current trends and um, so what was going on uh, in our twelve hundred to fourteen fifty time frame. Okay, uh, so we are going to start in uh, East Asia. There we go. So you get my. All right, and yeah, we're going to, uh, and, and again, in our minds, we, when we hear East Asia, we want to kind of, we want to equate that with China, okay? And so um, we uh, last left off with the uh, the Hong, Han Dynasty, the Tang Dynasty, and, and now we uh, shift on over to the Song Dynasty. Again, these names changing as different uh, emperors uh, take control and and family names, uh, sometimes geographic names, where these emperors come from, all kind of determining the names of the different dynasties. And so, as you can tell, this one starts well before our time frame here, but uh, ends kind of uh, into our, our 1200 uh, starting time frame. Okay. Uh, so, this is going to just kind of pick up from really what we were learning about. You know, we, we were talking about how in the, uh, the the Han and the Tang dynasties, uh, that uh, we had a lot of, of creating going on, whether it was a uh, gunpowder, paper, things like that. And um, we're definitely going to see a, a continuation of that with the Song dynasty. Um, they're going to be viewed as, really, for this early, early time in history, as kind of becoming like the manufacturing center of the world. Okay? And... Um, some of the things that they that they're they're manufacturing is creating is uh, a lot of working in metals, uh, cast iron metal, and so uh, goods like uh, uh, farming equipment, agricultural equipment, things like that. Um, they'll even be doing some uh, building of, uh, of buildings and bridges using some metals to uh, reinforce. Uh, they even come up with kind of an early crude version of of steel. Uh, let's you know as a stronger metal. Uh, all of this is what we refer to as uh, proto p r o t o industrialization, and uh, that term proto just means early. And so what we're seeing here is a, a little preview of uh, what will really explode uh, many many centuries later uh, when the industrial revolution uh, will take place. But uh, China kind of has its own little mini version of it going on here in these early, early times. And this is setting them apart from a lot of other uh, regions of the world and uh, definitely putting the Chinese um, ahead of the curve. Okay. So again, a little bit more there on that innovating as uh, the Song Dynasty takes over. Okay. Um, bureaucracy. When we, when we talk about uh, government, and we talk about how government organizes itself. Um, people by 1200 have uh, kind of learned through trial and error that uh, what often can lead to a most efficient running government 
is to set up all kinds of different departments and to have those departments run by specialists, people who are trained to just know how to work their specific department very well. Okay. So whether that department has to do with, you know, military defense or, you know, housing or, you know, public safety, but people are, you know, become experts and uh, the Song Dynasty kind of picking up to a certain extent. This is nothing that they invent that's new. This has been going on in the Tang Dynasty and uh, and even before. So this is an example of what we call continuity, okay? And yeah, that's a term you want to get down. Continuity meaning that, you know, some of these are things that, that we see continue on from from earlier times. And uh, and the the Song Dynasty will, will take the imperial bureaucracy that had already been established and then they will will build on it even more so. Okay, just kind of uh, again the whole idea of trying to create an efficient government. Now, there's a downside uh, to working with bureaucracies, and uh, and and the Song Dynasty will experience this, uh, as many other bureaucracies have uh, have learned over time, including to the here and now. And that is, they can get really expensive. Uh, as you create more and more departments, as you break down, you know, responsibilities to, you know, smaller and smaller levels, um, just the, the expense of having to operate a bureaucracy uh, can really start to work against a, a, a you know, a government, you know, a country over time. So that's always one of those kind of those little cautions out there uh, when we talk about bureaucracy. That term imperial, by the way, that you see there, imperial is whenever we're talking about a... Uh, a government that seeks to uh, to be an empire, okay? Uh, they want to expand. They want to grow. Um, you know, whether that's through military conquest, whether that's through negotiating treaties, but, you know, they, they are in an expanding mode. Uh, that's where that term imperial comes into play. Uh, if a country is completely satisfied with the size that they are and have no, you know, aspirations of growth, you know, then you're not going to necessarily see that word. But when you de do see that word pop up, I mean, you know, one of our units late, much later on uh, will we'll focus on imperialism. And, you know, that's a term that really all of you should be somewhat familiar with from last year. Uh, but so that that's where that, that kicks in there, right, with that bureaucracy. All right, moving along. Um, speaking of continuity, all right, you know, we talked about these two terms um, with uh, some of these prior dynasties. And this is definitely something that the uh, the Song Dynasty is is going to continue, um, and again, you know, it just bucks that trend. Where whereas we still in you know the 1200 to 1450 time frame, we see in a lot of other parts of the world that uh, your social mobility is based really only on who your parents are, you know, your family, and where that places you, uh, you know, in a social ladder. In, in a country or an empire or kingdom, wherever you may live. Um, the Chinese are, are setting themselves apart by operating this system where, you know, it, it allows upward mobility in their social ladder. Uh, even if you come from rather humble means, if you're able to gain education and, uh, and you know, are able to pass a civil service exam, uh, that's going to get you a role uh, taking a, a job in that bureaucracy and, you know, a, a government uh, government salary. And, you know, again, you're on the way to moving up the social ladder. And so that, you know, again, that is that whole concept of meritocracy. It's a complete opposite of aristocracy where it's all connected to, you know, again, who you're born to the family line and meritocracy all comes down to the merit of you, your work, your character, your effort, that sort of a thing. Okay. So the Song Dynasty definitely is going to, uh, we're going to see that as an example of continuity into the Song Dynasty, all right? Um, so when we talk about pros and cons, um, you know, again, pros, some of these continuities that they bring along uh, are going to, initially, are going to help to to make, um, you know, basically, I mean, make, make China much more powerful than, than other parts of the world. Um, but um, as, as I mentioned there with number two, you know, one of the cons is that we are going to, over the long stretch of time, see the Song Dynasty weakened uh, by the expense of the government system that they that they create and that they grow. And so that's kind of, you know, your, your pluses. I mean, you've got a government that is allowing for innovation and proto-industrial, you know, industrialization. 
um, you know, those kinds of things to the good side. But on, on the bad side, you know, slowly and steadily, the government is, is growing in size to what is going to eventually create some significant problems uh, for the Song Dynasty. All right. And then let's see, heading on into uh, post-classical, post-classical China. Let's see, uh, how am I going to define this? Um, um, I suppose, so, you know, we, we talked about, uh, you know, like the Gupta Empire. You know, we talked about like this golden age. Um, China's going to have some golden ages too, all right? And anytime, you know, we see these countries, these regions, kind of these peaks in power where everything's kind of running really smoothly. It's like, boom, we have a golden age. And, um, and, and usually post-classical China is described as the time period after the, the Tang Dynasty. So, you know, Song Dynasty, we're grooving right in there. And, and this is seen before that, that, that government growth issue becomes a real problem. Um, it's going to be viewed as a golden age in Chinese history, okay? Uh, just the way the Song Dynasty is able to build on the Tang Dynasty. So that's that's our, our definition there of what post-classical China is, is all about, all right? Okay. And um, and so let's uh, focus here on just, uh, yeah, how significant uh, trade is going to be. Um, China will become the largest uh, trade center, um, trade market in the known world at that time, um, which is ironic or not ironic when you think about the importance of China in world trade even today. Um, you know, the, 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 they will fade it at a point in history, but, uh, you know, here in the, the, the late 20th and early 21st century, uh, China once again has come roaring back. But back in these early days, some of this innovating that they're doing and producing things that just, you know, cannot be uh, found in other parts of the world, um, yeah, for sure, you know, that's going to put them in that position um, of, of just being just this juggernaut in terms of their, their trade power, uh, with, with other parts of the world, whether it be off to, you know, Southwest Asia, Southeast Asia, and, uh, over time, Chinese trade goods making it to, you know, Europe and some, even some parts of Africa, uh, down into India, you know, that kind of thing. And because many of those trade goods cannot be had in their home countries, the demand will be, will be pretty great. All right. Um, Again, some of those things that, uh, you know, that there's going to be demand for, uh, and, and then some of these just things that will be, will be used in to, to kind of grow the power of the Song Dynasty, where we talked about gunpowder. And, uh, as time goes on, um, you know, and, and other countries come to realize the, uh, the military, um, abilities and, and you know, and, and capabilities gunpowder can give them, you know, obviously that's going to be, um, that's going to be in high demand. Champa rice. Um, I think they left us alone on this last year's AP test. It's kind of a, it's kind of almost like a bad, like AP world meme. Um, Champa rice is a, uh, is a strain of rice that uh, grows in China that is really, really hardy. In other words, you know, it, it, it you don't have to have like a perfect climate. Um, it can be a little, maybe not as as wet as, as usually you need it to be, uh, to be able to to grow rice and in, in rice patties. Uh, Champa rice is is a little just it's it's yeah it's tough rice. It's easier to grow, and it's a staple food of China back at that time. Um, I mean, still to a certain extent is to this day, and uh, this can be one of the things that's going to be helping the. Uh, the Song Dynasty to grow is, you know, having a food supply um, that's going to facilitate a growing population. And the, the you know, basically the, the creation of this strain of rice is really going to play a large role in also helping kind of behind the scenes for the Song Dynasty in China uh, to become powerful. Uh, fertilizers and irrigation kind of tie in there. These are areas, again, where the, uh, the, the Chinese are innovating. Uh, in terms of irrigation methods, and then the use of fertilizers, whether it's kind of a ground bone, uh, you know, other kind of, I mean, early forms of, of fertilizer, you know, animal waste, you know, things like that, um, that also that they're experimenting with and perfecting in terms of being able to use uh, in the uh, the growing of crops, all right, like the rice and, uh, and others. And so, yeah, you've got uh, this kind of, you know, some agricultural innovating going on, 
And uh, and then, you know, again, gunpowder, as we'll learn as time goes on here, is just going to be a massive game changer when it comes to uh, global politics. OK, um, there's that proto-industrialization back uh, at us again. And uh, sometimes we'll see these kind of repeat on us, which is kind of a little hint for us that, you know, hmm, uh, College Board might really want us to make sure that we we understand this concept. So, you know, again, proto early. And, uh, the, and the Chinese are kind of the first to, uh, to really uh, make use of some of these early industrial kind of methods. And like I said, you know, metals that, um, I mean, compared to what we have nowadays, I mean, there is no comparison. These are metals back then that could be fairly weak, um, you know, would, would give over time, you know, that sort of thing. But um, still, it's, it's the beginning of the process. Um, that commercialized society that you see described there, uh, really just kind of gets the, you know, when we talk about commercialization, we were talking about business when you get right down to it. And, uh, and so with this commercialized society, um, you know, you're going to see the rise of like an artisan class in, in China. And these are going to be people who, whether it's their metal workers, whether they are clay workers, like you see pictured there, you know, making the storage containers and that kind of thing. Um, you know, people who learn a skill, you know, become an artisan, artisan is the fancy term for it. And, you know, and, and are able to, to flip that into a business opportunity for themselves to make money. And uh, we, we put that all together and that's where we get that concept of a commercialized society where people are encouraged to learn a skill that, you know, that they're going to be able to, to turn around and, and make a living at and, uh, and be able to make, uh, like I said, make profits from. Okay. Uh, let's see, what else do we have as we move down here? Social structures. Oh, oh let's get some of that. Okay. First of all, um, China, yeah, I guess while we're going through all these firsts with China, um, we can also talk about uh, their urban areas. And they're not the first to, to come up with urban areas. I guess maybe I'll just say biggest. Um, China is going to, and what, and, and, World studies, folks, this, this is a term that's not as familiar to you. We talked a little bit about it, Industrial Revolution Unit. But when you see that word urban, you just want to think like cities, okay? Built up areas of population, cities, towns, uh, that kind of thing. AP Huggers, we did a whole unit on this. So I would assume you are, you know, you're fine. Um, and uh, China, for, its, for the time, is, has some of the biggest cities uh, in the world. Okay, um, and, and some historians argue not even just some. I mean, they have the biggest cities in the world, uh, and you know, just built up uh, urban areas that uh, far and away from what we're going to see, um, you know, especially in Europe, but you know, even moving on into uh, Southwest Asia, you know, other parts of get what I'm going to refer to as the as the known world. Okay. And so uh, it's going to be within these cities that, you know, you're going to see these social structures develop. Um, again, kind of like we talked about the caste system, kind of like we talked about feudalism, you know, those sorts of things. All right. So um, the uh, the social pyramid. I don't know. Did I do this for you or not? I didn't. Oh, my goodness. Go back. Go back. Go back. All right. There we go. I guess I'm going to uh, describe the social pyramid for you here, okay? I didn't know if I had gone into uh, detail on that or not. So um, what you have here, their, their, little, their little pyramid, uh, what they usually put at the top was, well, we'll start with the aristocracy. That's usually where your emperors and, you know, all your hereditary leaders are going to be coming from. And again, this is kept in the family, you know. Again, a lot of these are patriarchal, so father to son, you know, his son to, to his, you know, son, and on and on and on. Below them is what they called the scholar gentry. Okay, gentry is kind of a reference back to like gentlemen. Uh, a lot of times these are people who are educated. Uh, they, because they are educated, they've been able to uh, to flip that into uh, some kind of position, sometimes in government, sometimes in private business. But uh, uh, they these are usually people who are relatively wealthy and are able to live a, a pretty comfortable lifestyle. Uh, because of wealth that they've been able to uh, acquire themselves through their education, uh, whether it's been passed through family, that kind of thing. Okay. After the scholar gentry come farmers. Okay. And again, fairly high uh, in the the social ladder there because of the critical importance of farmers to supplying food uh, to uh, to all the people. And so, um, you know, those are people that uh, that do 
are, are seen, you know, with a, a fair amount of respect uh, in Chinese uh, social structures. Uh, beneath the farmers are the artisans, okay? Uh, still important because they produce things, you know, that make money. Uh, but, uh, you know, food is more important than, I guess, you know, the plate to put the food on. Um, and so it kind of falls down in that order. Um, merchants coming in after that, again, you know, as we talked about in class, uh, these people that uh, still in these early days are kind of viewed by some, I'm not, I don't know if the word is suspicion, but, you know, at the same time, it's kind of like, you don't make anything, you know, you just, you're a middleman, you exchange money, you know, you just, yeah, you don't do anything yourself that, uh, you know, that produces a thing. And then uh, down at the very bottom of the uh, the social ladder were peasants. And uh, kind of, if I'm going to make a differentiation between peasants and the farmers for, further on up there, a lot of times the farmers might be people who actually own land uh, that they farm. And then the peasants are going to be people who work on those farms and don't own anything and pretty much just live by, you know, the labor that they sell and uh, and usually have to sell it pretty cheaply uh, just because of the uh, the population and, and that sort of thing. So there you go. That's your social ladder that uh, you would find in uh, China during this time. Okay. All right. And from there, where do we head? Oh, women. Women in the Song era. So, ladies, you know, we talked a lot about uh, the patriarchy back there in Unit Zero. Um, how do we... How do I put this? So in the Song Dynasty, men were definitely told that they needed to respect women. Okay, um, there there was there was that level where you know that was kind of part of of their their social norms, but at the same time, women were expected to show deference to men. And when I say deference, I mean bottom line, you're going to bow down to you know a man's wishes, um, and so you know. While there's that respect element at the same time, you know, it only goes so far. And so, again, we're, we are talking about a, a, a patriarchal system um, that uh, that is going to allow women only the the rights and equality, the qualities that they that they choose to give it, which is limited. OK, uh, the picture you see over here on the uh, the right side, uh, a. Um, Kind of unusual uh, social custom of the uh, the upper classes in uh, Song Dynasty China. Actually, you could call this another example of some continuity because uh, it wasn't created during the Song Dynasty. This is just being brought uh, along from uh, earlier earlier time periods in Chinese history. Um, this is uh, called foot binding, and foot binding uh, the the Chinese. You know, I, I mean, think about every. You know, every era that we've lived in, including current times, every time in history, uh, we have our our perceptions of what makes people look beautiful. OK, men, women, whatever it may be. We have our perceptions of, of what makes people look beautiful. Uh, in the Song era, women were viewed as being the most beautiful when they had these dainty little feet, tiny little, tiny little feet. And, um, and so to accomplish that, uh, what they would do, and this is typically in the upper classes, okay, is that uh, as soon as a, uh, a baby girl is born, they would bind the foot. I'm going to show you a picture. It's going to probably cringe some of you out, but, you know, it's my favorite part of the class. Um, there you go. And, and you can kind of see where what happens to this foot over time when it's being wrapped from the time you're just a little baby and your bones even haven't completely fused and this tight, tight wrapping of it. And what it does is it, you know, I mean, it doesn't necessarily break the foot, but it, it creates this incredibly unnatural bend into it uh, that, that, you know, and, and result uh, creates these tiny little feet that they believed were really, really hot looking, I guess. Okay. Um, there we go. You know, um, and you know, I mean, again, um, people will someday look at some of our, you know, some of our norms. They'll look at, uh, you know, the way that, uh, 
you know, both men and women now, you know, um, you know, using Botox to, you know, kind of eliminate wrinkles and, you know, the lips and all. I mean, people, people are going to look at us someday and kind of the same thing. It's like, what, what, what? Uh, just like we look at this, but uh, yeah, no. If you were if you were upper class, if you were of of the wealthier classes, definitely in the arist aristocracy, um, and you were a woman, um, this was your life. Okay, um, we're going to be running any marathons, that's for sure. Okay, uh, let's see. How am I doing? Oh my goodness, where is the time going? I think I think we'd be making better time if I well, number one felt better. I feel like I'm probably meandering here. But uh, you're getting plenty of information, aren't you, kids? Um, all right, so let's see if I can just grind it down. We'll get down to, uh, yeah, we'll get down here to uh, religious diversity in China. Uh, maybe hit the brakes there. All right, um, so let's talk about some uh, some other developments that uh, is going on. Um, you know, that merit, one of the things the meritocracy does in China is um, it, it really does place uh, – a fairly strong emphasis on education. Um, if you're in the peasant class, you're not going to be, you're not going to be educated. Um, you know, there's just going to be an understanding that, um, you're, you're, you're going to farm, you know, you're not going to own land, but you're going to farm. Um, there's going to be, there's going to be stories from time to time about, uh, farmers, uh, who own land, who, you know, maybe recognize one of the peasants working on their land seems exceptionally, you know, bright, and uh, maybe maybe see to it that 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 peasant becomes educated. Um, you know, when this isn't as rigid as like you know, like we talked about the caste system in South Asia. Um, and so, you know, I mean, there there's avenues uh, for for people to to gain an education. Um, still, you know, it's going to be the easiest had by people who have some access to money. So probably pretty much kind of like artisan class on up. And then over time, the merchants will uh, more and more so. Um, some of the other innovating that will come out of that will be uh, the the invention of block printing, and uh, this is going to be kind of the precursor of the uh, the printing press that will be perfected in Europe uh, sometime later. Um, but the uh, the Chinese really are the ones who who kind of set the tone for this and use this for um, you know. They've they already created paper, and so this is just going to make printing all the easier. Um, you know, farming manuals, religious texts, uh, all kinds of things like that that they're going to be able to, uh, to print up. And then eventually they'll, uh, they'll move that into printing currency. Um, this is still in a time when a lot of uh, everything is, you know, trade and barter, that kind of thing, but uh, currency, okay? And uh, as, as cool as it would like, we'd like to think it, no, I don't think there was any block printing Rubik's Cubes back then, but you know, hey, it was on. I found it on the internet. It must be true. Um, and uh, this will uh, definitely put again China ahead of the curve of other parts of the world uh, when it comes to the overall distribution of of literature. Um, again, it requires you know you know how to read and, and all that kind of thing, and, and that doesn't describe the entire population of China. Um, but if we look at it in more of like a per capita, you know, kind of a sense. Um, we, we probably see a little bit more of a literate population in China than we're going to see compared to other parts of the other uh, world in our unit one time frame. And so, uh, yeah, you got that. All right. And then, uh, let's see with, uh, with education and literacy. Well, it, you kind of like, it, it kind of like turns into a, a loop here that, uh, you know, the education is going to feed and power more innovation and the innovation in turn is going to create the need for more education so they they, they end up kind of feeding on each other and uh, you know again the, the, the growth of literacy and the growth of education and opening those uh, those options to uh, to more and more people all right and I think that's probably all we need to cover for now so uh, when we get back into this and hopefully with me in class because this is really frustrating. I don't like being gone, as you know. Um, so, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll jump into uh, the rule of religion in uh, Song Dynasty uh, China when uh, we're back together on this. And like I said, hopefully in person, in class, all of that. Okay, guys, that'll get you a start going on our first unit. Now into this information that could show up in May on the AP test. All right. All right. Hope you got enough.
and uh, we'll see you soon. <laughs>